for several weeks, he, and he was saying, I really think you should do this, Karen. Like, oh, great. So here we are. And, you know, I approach this passage, like I approach a lot of passages I may not be drawn to personally, but I have this kind of thing where if Jesus said it, there must be something in there I can learn from him about God. So here we are, um, Matthew chapter 6, verses 16 through 18. So what is fasting anyway? Another one of those words we just don't use day to day. So I looked it up and I found fasting is a voluntary choice not to eat at all or eat or drink for a specific period in response to something, often a sacred or grievous period of one's life. The tough part about applying this message today is that when you read this in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus was assuming that his followers were, had a regular practice of fasting. It's as though it was, it was written for people who are already practicing this. And of course, I don't know anybody that does fasting on a regular basis. Maybe a few of my Catholic friends, but that's about it. So, you know, I'm not going to use this sermon to try to convince all of us, including myself, that we should try fasting a little bit more often. I know that's kind of a lost cause. God bless us. Um, but there are some things, like I said, in this passage we can learn from. And the first is that when we've been talking about it for all of Lent so far, motive matters to Jesus. That's what all of these passages have been about. It's talking about kind of the secret things we do to love God more and to get to know God better. Um, and the secret things maybe we don't do or do maybe in not so great a way or bad motivations. Um, God cares about all of that and he sees all of that. And secondly, um, fasting and other spiritual practices we have do not guarantee gains from God. Right? It's, that's the kind of idea, of, like a slot machine God. Well, if I just put enough coins in, I'll win eventually. Um, you know, that's not the God that we know from Scripture. The God that we know from Scripture is relational. And our relationship begins first with God's love, and we respond to that. Now, um, happily, as I was working on this message, I remembered a post one of my friends had posted at the beginning of Lent about Pope Francis, and it was a New York Times article. And they were quoting his Lenten message, um, which I imagine he gave on Ash Wednesday. And this is what he said. He said, indifference to our neighbor and to God also represents a real temptation for us Christians. Each year during Lent, we need to hear once more the voice of the prophets who cry out and trouble our conscience. So um, Pope Francis had noticed, and probably the people that work with him had noticed, that people are giving things up for Lent that aren't even Christians because they seek some sort of benefit in their lives. So uh, let me keep going and um, see if, if this resonates with you like it did with me. Um, He's describing this phenomenon that he calls the globalization of indifference. Francis wrote that whenever our interior life becomes caught up in its own interests and concerns, there is no longer room for others, no place for the poor. God's voice is no longer heard, the quiet joy of his love is no longer felt, and the desire to do good fades. He continues, we end up being incapable of feeling compassion at the outcry of the poor, weeping for our other people's pain and feeling a need to help them as though all this were someone else's responsibility and, our, and not our own. Um, so he suggests that we try something different, that we fast from indifference. And when we begin to fast from indifference, when we give up indifference, we can begin to feast on love. In fact, Lent is the perfect time to learn how to love again. Jesus, the great pr protagonist of this holy season, certainly showed us the way. In him, God descends all the way down to bring everyone up, 
In his life and his ministry, no one is excluded. The Times article continues by saying that the practice of fasting is, well, like I said, it's increasing in popularity. And Pope Francis, in his corrective suggestion to fast from indifference, joins a long tradition of prophets who have called out those who fast because they seek to manipulate God or to gain something um, while they neglect the poor and the oppressed. So that brings us back to the passage from Isaiah that Mark read for us. And sometimes if I read a prophet in the, in the Old Testament like Isaiah, sometimes it, it feels good to have somebody call me on my stuff. Do you know what I mean? Somebody's like, you know, Karen, you, you, you've got further to go. It's, it's almost encouraging to hear, some, to hear the scripture challenge you in this way. At least that's kind of how it is for me. So um, let's listen again to the prophet Isaiah being told by God that Israel is missing the mark in spite of their supposed spirituality. And you can almost hear kind of the attitude in um, this version that I'm going to read. It says, um, yet they act so pious. They come to the temple every day and seem delighted to learn all about me. This is God speaking through Isaiah. They act like a righteous nation that would never abandon the laws of its God. They ask me to take action on their behalf, pretending they want to be near me. They ha we have fasted before you, they say. Why aren't you impressed, God? We have been very hard on ourselves, and you don't even notice it. Can you, you know, I could put myself in these shoes. God, I've been to church. I've prayed, and you haven't even noticed. So put yourself in this. Isaiah is confronting a problem we see all the time in church, religious practice without pragmatic love. And when we don't see God do good for us, we might complain like Israel did. Here is God's response through Isaiah. He says, I will tell you why I respond. It's because you are fasting to please yourselves. Even while you fast, you keep oppressing your workers. What good is fasting when you keep on fighting and quarreling? This kind of fasting will never get you anywhere with me. You humble yourselves by going through the motions of penance, bowing your heads like reeds bending in the wind. You dress in burlap and cover yourselves with ashes. Is that is this what you call fasting? Do you really think this will please the Lord? So often, you know, we, we can put ourselves in these places. You know, we, when we're at church, we are loving, gentle people. We care for others. But when we're, we can be different when we're with our employees and money's involved, or we're with our family and there's a time crunch and the schedule's not fitting together. Um, you know, in, in other contexts, we're not fully, Christ's presence isn't fully in us in those times. Isaiah has a prescription for us who sometimes act religious but are going through the motions. Uh, a cure for the indifference that has dried up our interior life, as Pope Francis suggested. And uh, verses 6 through 12 say this. No, this is the kind of fasting I want. This is God speaking again. Free those who are wrongly imprisoned. Lighten the burden of those who work for you. Let the oppressed go free and remove the chains that bind people. Share your food with the hungry and give shelter to the homeless. Give clothes to those who need them and do not hide from relatives who need your help. That, one's, that one hit me freshly this time. I'm going to read that one again. Do not hide from relatives who need your help. Then your salvation will come like the dawn, and your wounds will quickly heal. Your godliness will lead you forward, and the glory of the Lord will protect you from behind. Then you will call. The Lord will answer, yes, I am here. He will quickly quickly reply, remove the heavy yoke of oppression, stop pointing your finger and spreading vicious rumors. Teenagers, stop pointing your finger and spreading vicious rumors. Huh. Bible doesn't apply to real life, right? Feed the hungry and help those who trouble uh, in trouble. When you, then your light will shine out from the darkness, and the darkness around you will be as bright as noon. The Lord will guide you continually, giving you water when you are dry and restoring your strength. Isn't that what we want? 
Lord, give us water when we're dry. Restore our strength when we're weary. You will be like a well-watered garden, like an ever-flowing spring. Some of you will rebuild the deserted ruins of your cities. Then you will be known as re a rebuilder of walls and a restorer of homes. God, I want to be a rebuilder of walls and restorer of homes in my town, in this state. Can you imagine what we can do with God on our side? Then your godliness will lead you forward. We will, that will be the first thing drawing us out into the life that we're living with God. What's so cool about this passage is that this is the passage Jesus quotes at the beginning of his ministry. This is what it's all about for Jesus. You know, it's, it's not about the spiritual rituals we may or may not do. You know, some, you know, sometimes we do them to really please God and we're really well motivated and that's great. But before we even start that, you know, Jesus takes us back to, to the beginning of, of uh, God's love. This is, this, I'm going to remind you what Jesus said at the beginning of his ministry when he quotes this passage. He says, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has set me to proclaim freedom to the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then he rolled up his scroll and he said to them, today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Jesus was about this. God present in Jesus was calling us back to God's love, practical love lived out in our everyday lives. And this is what pleases God. And if we live our lives motivated by God's love, then God will have our back. Then we'll be known as a restorer of homes and rebuilder of walls. Our church will be the restorer of homes and the rebuilder of walls. So, I got excited. I, I want so badly for us to get this. I, I want to, I mean, you know, I'm preaching to myself today. I want to be motivated by love in my life. I want to be more about that than anything else in my life. And I suffer, suffer, I suffer from this indifference problem we all have. I, you know, we just get comfortable. And it takes a lot to get us out of our comfortable, cushy couch position. Can I get a head nod? All right. So I was um, praying and thinking about, you know, Lord, how, will you, how can you get us out of this, right? I came up with three ways. Um, you could come up with some other ways. Um, one is kind of a bonus, so I'll say four, because the concert last night, the Heidi and Friends concert, was really um, moving. It was incredible, and it, that reminded me that art has a way of kind of getting us out of our comfort zone. Really good art has a way of um, making us care about things that we may have forgotten we cared about, so that's your bonus material. Um, but. When I was writing my sermon, I thought, well, one way to, to fast from indifference is to get involved in a place like, like our church. Because I think you find that when you get involved in this place, it's really hard to avoid people who live from this place of God's love. When you get involved here, you wind up meeting people who really care about children and are... Um, living God's love as they, they serve our children through Sunday school or other programs. You wind up meeting people that really care about the homeless, and uh, they invite you to go do things that get you out of your comfort zone. And you might have an experience like Caitlin did, where she got to meet somebody who was, um, who was you know, really needing those services. So that's, that's one way we can fast from indifference. Plug in. Just, just get a little deeper and, and see how that changes you. Um, the second way is a great way to fast from indifference is to put yourself... Okay, well, that's kind of... I separated those things, but they sound kind of similar. So that's what I did. Get involved here. And then the second one is put yourself in a position like Caitlin did where she... 
she was really out of her comfort zone. And, and Kayla did something, you know, we all kind of painted some walls and stuff, and you can do that in a service project. There's service projects where you're not, where you're helping people, but you're not necessarily interacting with people. And I actually think when you start interacting with people that are different from us, uh, that's when we really get moved past this indifference. That's when we start realizing, oh, it's not an us and a them thing. Like, we have things in common, and, and I care about them because I actually care about people like me. That's part of what happens. And so get yourself in a position where you are actually interacting with somebody who is different from you. And then thirdly, <coughs> I mentioned getting involved in church, getting yourself in an uncomfortable position with someone different from you. But thirdly, we got to get ourselves around Jesus. There is no substitute for that. We, we have to let the scripture challenge how we live our lives. And Jesus does that in a way uh, we can't challenge each other. These scriptures should challenge us. They should, they should call us to our knees. We should rethink how we do things. We should rethink our priorities because God's love can give us a vision for life that's really different from the vision that our culture tends to give us. But it's so much better. This is what I've been trying to get across to the teenagers from time to time, is that life with God, it's different than life the way that the culture says to live it, but it's actually more exciting. You can be a restorer of homes, a rebuilder of walls. You can be somebody who makes a difference in people's lives in a big way. We, we lose track of that, but that's, that's the calling. That's the calling of Christ. That's the calling of Christianity. So, may it be so. May it be so. Lord, help us. Can I get an amen? All right.